Bashir's, Bashir is my husband's name. His I-130 was approved in November, November 18, last year. He had to escape Yemen, risked his life, but he had to get out. And so he went through the vetting process. November 18 was like, oh my God, yes, he finally is going to be here. I was thinking, okay, March, April, he's going to be here. And then what happens? Everything is like up in the air now, so. You know, I didn't want to believe it. I thought that it was just another way for Donald Trump to score political points. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. The Muslim ban, that's just too crazy to think that he was actually going to like <laughs> attempt to, you know, uh, to, to actually implement um, his crazy talk. Donald Trump issued an executive order banning immigrants from entering the United States from seven Muslim-majority countries. This was, in effect, and actually, a Muslim ban. And so when the policy was issued, it was conveniently issued 5 o'clock on a Friday. Courts are not open, or not typically open. There was a press conference at the White House. We heard that it had been signed. We didn't see it for a few hours. Everybody's going back and forth, trying to, to get a copy of it. Finally got posted on the White House website. If you are from these seven countries, you will be detained, you will be interrogated. It's as if rights and the Constitution didn't apply to you. It just felt like my whole community was being attacked at that moment. So late that Friday night, we heard that the first two people from Iraq had been um, held at the airport and were being held there. And then it became very clear that there were a lot more than just two. It's already hard being in a long distance relationship and like trying to get him here to join me. And then when it came out, it was like, I was really very, very sad. <laughs> And then I woke up in the morning and I was like, no, 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 no. This is not going to happen. No. Instead of just getting angry, I channeled my anger into the work. And then I did a call to action. I said, if you have any moral decency or value, dignity, then make your way to JFK Airport because this is inhumane. The next morning I woke up and Murad and the uh, New York Immigration Coalition already said, okay, rally, protest in front at JFK, come out, you need to come out, you have rights. As we were getting more protesters in, we were making announcements that we needed lawyers who were admitted in the Eastern District. Perfect, I can be useful beyond my loud voice. I headed down to Terminal 4 and there was a beehive. And I said, I'm licensed in both districts, what do you need me to do? We started trying to assign stations. We had like an intake station. We had lawyers, you know, like working on habeases. We had a media station because media was all over the place and this volunteer just stepped up and she was like, I can handle media. I'm like, great, you're a media, you're a comms person. Felt like an emergency room when we were in triage. It was insane, like people were just like, somebody got off a flight at 8 p.m. and was like, I wanna help, called his eight month pregnant wife and said, I'm not coming home tonight and stayed overnight helping us set up tech systems. So so we were working with family and friends who were at the airport in the arrival section waiting to greet their family members. An hour went by, two hours went by, three hours went by, it's like, they're not coming out. So I arrived in JFK on a Friday evening around 10 p.m. The supervisor at first, from what I could hear, said, you should just process her like a regular green card holder. And as he was walking back, he called him back and said, no, actually, I'm sorry, I need to take you aside, you know, to another room for further questioning. They had just heard about the order, like 20 minutes before we had arrived. And they didn't, and without any direction of how to implement it. You know, and they said to us, we know just as much as you do, which was scary because we didn't know anything, you know. Then the officer said, I'm, I'm gonna have to handcuff you. One of the individuals, uh, Hamid, uh, has been detained. We asked where was he detained. Um, the, the lawyers pointed out behind those doors and Jerry and I basically forced ourselves into the room. We en encountered the Custom Patrol agents. They kept telling us they would not talk to us unless we left that room, uh, which we didn't do. So we were racing against time. We don't know what practices they were engaging in unless the people came out and told us. And that's where we found out of people being uh, essentially coerced or tricked into signing revocations of their green cards and visas. The pressure was just unbelievable. If this man was deported, I was just so afraid. At some point, one of the uh, agents uh, told us that we needed to talk to Trump. 
We say no. We were demanding uh, answers. I went inside to, to figure out what was happening with the Congress, um, congressmen and congresswomen, and I see them talking to a man, a journalist that I know was there, and I was like, you know, Will, what's happening? He said, that's one of the guys, that's Hamid Darwish. He's one of the guys there releasing him. The congresswoman and the congressman got him released. To me, where we were walking out, and so it's the two congresspeople, Hamid, and all I hear is these 250 New Yorkers shouting, welcome home. America is the greatest nation, the greatest people in the world. I realized that I saw two visions of America. The America of fear and intolerance manifested in Trump's executive order. On the other hand, Hamid saw the America of humanity, the thousands of people that were there. When I walked out with him, that was the America that I know. What sparked the national protests at airports was JFK. Had, you know, folks not shown up, I think everyone who was detained would have been deported. Finally, Judge Donnelly from the Eastern District issued an order Saturday at, I think, 9 or 9.30, and it was a huge relief. That stopped, effectively, the deportation of these people. And I do believe the public pressure really did influence the outcomes in the courts. We weren't going to sit there and say, oh, okay, this is how we are now. We were like, this is not who we are, and we're going to make sure that the rest of the world knows it. We were talking with our partners on the ground um, at JFK, and, you know, we felt we need to do something tomorrow. We need to, to continue this action because this fight's not over. And shortly after the court's ruling, we made an announcement that we were going to rally in Battery Park. By the time we kicked off the rally at 4, there was over 30,000 people, and we marched from Battery Park right in front of the Statue of Liberty to ensure that the Trump administration sees that there is a huge amount of, of support for these communities and that there's a huge amount of folks against their policies that they're trying to implement. Mr. President, that executive order is an affront to our American values. From our airports to the courts, to the streets, we will continue to fight for justice and freedom. Because this is America. 